Every believer is a priest, and every believer, priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, loving Father, for your grace. Thank you for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the royal family of God. Thank you for all that it means to us. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate it even more as we study together. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Ed, would you turn this on so I could see it? This here. Thank you. Appreciate it, sir. The question comes in as we look around us and see church after church as to uh, what church is legitimate, what church is not legitimate, what is the criterion for the selection of a church especially as one travels from place to place, visits or moves from area to area. What do you do in selecting a church? The common concept is a church is a church. Do you go to church? If a person goes answers yes in the affirmative, then they're all right. In fact, they're presumed to be Christian they go to church. But that isn't necessarily the case. And we have, therefore, a real serious problem that is involved as far as people understanding the, the church. And that's one of the points, of course, we're studying Galatians chapter 1, and as we come to 1-2, we read that it's written to the churches at Galatia, which makes us stop for a moment and look at the doctrine of the church, which is what we have been doing. And we've been looking at the first two points, the definition and the explanation, and some special passages on the church which are related to uh, the Word of God, uh, and the, specifically our Lord's first uh, or two major statements about the church one found in Matthew 16 and the other in Matthew chapter 28. Having looked at these, we understand some basic principles. Number one, the, the major purpose of the church is to baptize, go and to baptize. Now, he uses the word baptize rather than evangelize because baptism includes evangelism plus the faith response to that in the people believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to teach... Uh, the Word of God. These are found in uh, Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission. Uh, the reaching out and the communication of doctrine to these people. Then in Matthew 16 where the Lord uh, talks to Peter, we have discounted this uh, foolishness about Peter is the rock and the big rock and the little rock or the major chunk and the, uh, uh, the uh, big uh, massive rock as being irrelevant and immaterial. Just the very fact that three things. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will build my church. Secondly, please note, I will build my church. It would be to be future to the time of his incarnation and his humanity. And thirdly, he will build his church. It is his and it will always be his. And this second one introduces us to point three in the doctrine, and that is the distinction between Israel and the church. Now, this is a very 
important distinction. Most of the major denominations, most churches in America are churches which have gone through, come, come out of the Reformation. And the Reformation was very, very important because it called the church back to salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. As uh, uh, Martin Luther put it, sola gratia, sola fide, and sola Christas. Uh, those are the three, supposedly the three tenets of Lutheranism. Fortunately, in practice, it doesn't work out that way because they believe in uh, uh, baptism, uh, baptismal regeneration for babies, and uh, uh, they, they came out of Romanism, but somebody said not far enough. But they did at least call attention to the fact salvation by grace, which was one of the two great revelations which God gave to the Apostle Paul. The second of those, however, has been neglected by Reformation theology, and that is the, the distinction between Israel and the church. And what has happened, therefore, is a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. If you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, we will look for a moment at the second of these two revelations. We looked at it the other day to give you the basis for the two revelations. Two distinct revelations were given to the Apostle Paul from our Lord Jesus Christ. The first was that uh, the salvation by grace through faith. The second, however, was different. Now, beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, just as introduction, he gets to the meat of the message in verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration. Now, let's take this word administration. If you're reading from the King James Version, you have this word translated this way. Dispensation. The Greek word looks like this. O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. Oikonomia. Oikos is the word for household. Nomia is a form of the word namas, which is the word law. The law of the household. Deuteronomy is a Greek word, not a Hebrew word. The second book of the Bible, uh, third book of the Bible means second, deutero is second, and namas is law, second law. This is the oikonomia, uh, oikos household nomia law, the law of the household. And uh, when he uses the word administration, you should understand that this word views the world as the household of God. And... Uh, God has given a number of different laws for the governing of his household. That's what, it, that's what the, the principle means. For example, to Adam and Eve, the law that was given was something that is not applicable at any other time in any of human history. Thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, he didn't tell that to Abraham. He didn't tell it to Moses, to David. He didn't tell it to the church. It was a distinct law for the household which was run by Adam and Eve for a particular period of time. So, understanding that, keep that in mind as we move on in our passage, Ephesians 3, 2. Surely you have heard about the administration or the dispensation of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, verse 3, the sacred secret, the mystery doctrine, made known to me by revelation. Remember I said this is one of the two things that God revealed to Paul, as I have already briefly written. Verse 4, in reading this then, 
you will be able to understand my insight into the sacred secret of Christ. Now verse 9 says, verse 5 says, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This sacred secret, now what is the sacred secret? Is that through the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ. Now, verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace, uh, though I am less than least of all the apostles. But, he goes on to say, although I am less than least of all of God's people, this grace was given to me to announce the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone, note the next word, the administration. It's the same word, oikonomia. It, the dispensation of this sacred secret, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. But now, verse 10, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. So that here is the point of time that is the now, that now, something which was hidden in the past, is revealed and uh, by means of this unique organism called the church something is made known to the angelic conflict to the, to the principalities and powers to the angels something that the angels never would have known apart from something which is being done with this unique organism called the church therefore everything which has preceded this this period is related to it, but is different because the information of this period of time that he just says here, and he says it three ways, three different ways, that it has been kept a secret. It has been kept a mystery or a sacred secret from men in the past, but has now been revealed by to the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And that is the dispensation or the period known as the church age. Now, we uh, have to understand that we're talking, therefore, about a, a sub-doctrine called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. But dispensationalism is a form of theology that does more than just divide time into periods or epochs or dispensations. And you must be very careful, as I will tell you again later, just because someone divides time into epochs does not mean they are dispensationalists. Charles Hodge, who is the the theologian who is, has written a three-volume uh, systematic theology is the, uh, uh, what do you say, the, the final word for covenant theology. And he has four dispensations. He sees four dispensations. So just because a person talks about different dispensations doesn't mean they are dispensationalists. There are five characteristics of dispensationalism. Five things that make dispensationalism the, 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 uh, what it is. And this is called the hermeneutic. I wrote, uh, this gentleman from Wales wrote to me and asked for our books. And he wrote a whole, pay, a whole 
a sheaf of questions, which would be st it'll s answered once he got into the books. But to give him a head start, he, uh, his questions were all re regarding this confusion here. And when I said, you must determine your hermeneutic, he said, I thought that your hermeneutic is determined by the Bible. Well, that would be wonderful if it was. It would be great. Then everybody would be a dispensationalist. But you see, we don't have that situation. And the question is this. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. That's all it means, the science of interpretation. How do you interpret the Scripture? And don't just kid yourself. This is the, this is the key to who is a true Bible believer and who is not a true Bible believer. And the majority of the thing, the first church of the frigid air, the majority of churches do not believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible, which is the hallmark of dispensationalism. The first characteristic is the literal interpretation of Scripture, which means that what the Bible wants to be said is said. In other words, you see, God wants to be understood. And because of that, He has revealed His mind in what is called a revelation. And he has, for his revelation, he has used words. And the literal interpretation of Scripture simply says this. God gives to words the same meaning that would be given in normal usage in any generation. Now you say, that sounds reasonable. Isn't that true? Oh, of course not. There's a new book just out that says, the, it, which talks about the new language and how to interpret what young people are saying. I mean, I am not up on those things, but I do know that the language has changed. A hunk today is different than a hunk of years ago. A, a hunk and a chunk were synonyms. And give me a chunk of cheese or a, a hunk today, I guess, is a good-looking guy. A jock was short for a jockey who rode a horse a few years ago. Today, it means something entirely different. Uh, when I was uh, younger, glad rags were clothes that were in times have changed. They don't call them that anymore. Uh, they, and so the language, the language changes. But we live in a time in which certain words uh, uh, don't mean what we think they mean. Like uh, somebody says, he's bad, means he's good. Today, now here's the thing, here's why I bring that out. In certain theology, covenant theology, they do not practice literal interpretation of Scripture. What they say is this, that behind the written words, as they are literally understood, is some secret spiritual meaning that can only be discerned by those who are spiritual. And this is called the spiritualizing of Scripture. And it's ludicrous to what, to what extent they will take these. It is evidenced in the interpretation of many parables, for example. Whenever you read a parable... You keep in mind the principle for interpretation of parables, and that is, it's a story with one point. 
It has one point to it. It is not to be taken apart and to be taken and say, well, this stands for this and this stands for that and this stands for that and this stands for the other thing. It has one point to it. That's why a lot of people are confused in the, in the parable of the man in prayer. Remember when, 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 the, when uh, in uh, uh, Luke 12, uh, uh, where uh, uh, he, he says, uh, 11 and 12, where he says, um, if, if a man has a friend and uh, he goes to that friend and asks for something, the man won't give him anything because he's asleep in bed. But if he keeps on asking, he keeps on pressuring him, the man will finally say, Oh, for goodness sake, to get rid of you, I'll give it to you. Now, if you're going to tell me that that's God, you don't know what God is like. God is not mean. God is not like that. God is not like that man. And that's not the point to say what God is like at all. But see, they take that out of context. And they make that say, well, that's what God is like. If you, if you keep on going to God with that same thing, keep on going, God's going to do it because he's going to get disgusted from here. That's wrong. That's doing despot to the Word of God, taking texts out of Scripture. Neither is God like the man who would give his son a scorpion when he asks for bread. God is never likened to someone in Scripture who is bad or evil. Because they don't look for the one point that God is making, that God the Son is making in the use of parables, they're looking to find all kinds of things, all kinds of uh, meanings. And they'll do that throughout all of Scripture. And they take it into the Old Testament. And you've got people who look at the ark... Noah's Ark having three floors. One floor represents God the Father, the other God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is no sense to that. Now, the Ark is used as a type of salvation in general. Those who were in the Ark were saved. Those who were outside the Ark were not saved. And God used, the Son uses that as an illustration. But He doesn't make... Uh, there They go, listen... Some of them go so far as to describe the animals in the ark as representing different kinds of peoples and different groups, different alleys, all in it. Oh, it's really, you, you, it's amazing what you find once you get into what's gone on with spiritualizing Scripture. That's why you must be very careful when you teach the Old Testament to make, it sh make sure that you are teaching... New Testament doctrine illustrating it with Old Testament stories. Because the Bible, the Lord said, if you teach a child in error, it is better for you that a millstone be hanged around your neck and you be cast into the depths of the sea. He, 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 he says, he tells the people in, in uh, uh, James chapter 3, do not desire to be a teacher because teachers will receive greater judgment. You cannot do despot to a child's soul by teaching error and expect God to overlook it. Now, you won't lose your salvation. Thank God for that. But God will not overlook it. You must be careful. Now, we, we have to teach the whole counsel of God. But we must be careful to teach the Old Testament as illustrations just as the Lord does it and Paul uses it. Paul uses the pillar and the cloud in 1 Corinthians, but he uses it as an illustration. The Lord Jesus uses as it was in the days of Noah as an illustration. But he doesn't press all of the, the individual uh, points of the thing, just as you don't press all the points of a parable. You use it for an illustration of the doctrine, the mystery doctrines of the New Testament. That's what comes. That's what I, is so important. And be careful about spiritualizing a scripture. Like, and, and, and it's done, I heard it done by well-known Bible teachers. If we understand that 
Because of this, the literal, literal interpretation of Scripture, the second point is the distinction between Israel and the church. Then we understand this, that nowhere in the Old Testament is the church found. Nowhere. It is not there. But, you see, I heard, I've heard someone take uh, 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 the book of Ruth, for example, you know. And they say Boaz is a type of Christ. And Ruth is a type of the, the church. That is not right. That is not right. They do the same thing with Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, they make Solomon a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Shulamite woman a type of the church. And they have, it's a beautiful love story, and it could illustrate the way the church ought to love the Lord Jesus Christ, but certainly you can't take it to take text out of te context. You see. Yeah, where do we get the, we have a song, uh, of course it says, He's the lily of the valley. That's, where does that come from? It comes from Song of Solomon. And it isn't him that's the lily of the valley, it's she that's the lily of the valley. Take texts out of context, beloved. You can prove anything. You can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. But you're not teaching truth. You're not teaching truth. Israel did not come into existence until the time of Moses. Prior to that, it was a family. But when Moses came and gave the Mosaic Law, he gave the Constitution for the nation. And that's the first place we have the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel exists then throughout the Old Testament period from the time of Moses. And it comes, enters into the place of time when the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom by God after the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that Israel now is set aside because up to this point uh, only the high priest could go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies. Now everyone can go because God opened the veil. So that ends Israel. Now Israel therefore is set aside. We'll put it this way. Israel is on hold. The hold button on the phone for Israel is on. And it's going to last all the time from the, from the day of Pentecost through to the rapture of the church. All of that time, Israel is on the hold button. There is no prophecy, there is no reference to Israel in the New Testament doctrines of the church except to say that from now on, he says, there is no Jew, there is no... Uh, uh, the, 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 the church, you are either Jew or Gentile or church. That's what you are. That's, he makes distinction that there are three kinds of humanity. Jew, Gentile, and church. That's it. There is the distinction of humanity during this church age. Now, once the rapture of the church takes place, the hold button is stopped. Israel comes back and is dealt with for seven more years to end the period of the Jewish age. At the second advent of Jesus Christ, at the end of the seven-year period, then he takes up another period of time called the Millennial Kingdom. But you see now, this nation of Israel has all kinds of prophecies which are related to it. Prophecies which are related to its, its land. It has, it has a land. And uh, I will give to you uh, some of the distinctions which are made between Israel and the church. Uh, and for these, of course, I am grateful not to my, myself, but rather uh, to uh, Dr. Lewis Perry Chafer, who uh, actually made these 25 uh, c uh, distinctions between Israel and the church so that we could understand some of the things. But uh, who was the head uh, of... Uh, of the family that became the nation, Abraham. And he is called consistently, isn't he, the father of the Jews. Your father Abraham, your father Abraham, your father. Who is the head of the church? Abraham? Absolutely not. The Lord Jesus Christ. What was the nationality of uh, the people uh, who lived under 
the law. It was Jewish. As a matter of fact, if you were born a Gentile and you wanted to be saved, how, would you, how could you be saved? You had to become a Jew. There, it's called, you had to become a proselyte. You had to be circumcised, become a Jew first, and then you could be saved. <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, the land that was given was a particular land called Palestine or Palestine. They had a particular land. But they did not have... What land belongs to the church? We have a heavenly city that we're looking for, something that is not on this earth. This group of people are looking for a kingdom on this earth. This group of people are looking for a heavenly city. This group of people is called the wife of Jehovah. This group of people is called the bride of Christ. Two different things. These people are called servants. These people are called royal family. To these people, the return is, a, is to be caught up together with them in the air. To these people, it is to be an earthly return in power and glory. To these people, they were given law upon law upon law, but no power or enablement. To these people, the people of the church was given the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish everything that God uh, called upon them to do. To these people was given the Olivet Discourse, found in Matthew 25, 26, and 27. To these people was given the Upper Room Discourse, found in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. It's an, these are two entirely different groups of people. And what has happened is that because the church uh, did not recover the truth, they have taken all of the things which are related to Israel, tried to apply them to the church, and when they don't fit, they have to spiritualize these things. Now, there are some similarities. Chafer says... There are similarities. Each, in turn, has its own relationship to God, to righteousness, to sin, to redemption, to salvation, to human responsibility, to destiny. They are each witnesses to the Word of God. Each may claim the same shepherd, have doctrines in common. The death of Christ avails for each. Both are loved. Each will be glorified. But they are not to be considered the same just because there are a few similarities between these two bodies of people. And therefore... Look at this, the matter of worship, for example. See, where these people here were told to worship in the city of Jerusalem, in a particular place called the temple. Therefore, it was called a sanctuary. But in this dispensation, in the dispensation of the church, we are told that the Lord does not dwell in temples made with hands. But that what do you not know? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom ye have from God, who is in you. Therefore, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And he says to, to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the time is coming and now is when men will not worship in your city, that is Samaria, or in Jerusalem, but... They will worship by means of the, the Holy Spirit who is in them, and uh, God is seeking such to worship Him, for they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So here there's a worship place and a worship service. Here is there, there is worship that comes from the soul of the believer inside of the temple, which is his own body. And therefore, the gathering together is not a worship service. It's totally different. That's the reason that when you go to a service in a church and they have to have a, uh, some kind of a worship, a call to worship, they have to turn to the Old Testament. As, I, as we looked earlier uh, in our own hymnal, we have something, uh, the inside front cover, the Lord is in His holy temple, but all the earth keeps silence, keeps silence before Him, which is taken from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. But you see, that's Old Testament. The Lord is in His holy temple, but where is the Lord now? The Lord is inside of every believer, which is His holy temple. And that, uh, you don't walk around your whole life being silent. You laugh and you enjoy life because 
you are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit of God is dwelling within you. The Lord Jesus Christ is dwelling within you. God the Father is actually dwelling within you. But where do you turn for, uh, for invitations to worship corporately? Well, you have to find uh, places in the Scripture. And uh, uh, they, the only place you can find them are some of the Psalms. And the Psalms were written uh, for the purpose of calling people uh, to worship and uh, certain types of worship. Uh, and uh, when it says uh, the Lord dwells in the praises of His people, He's talking about Old Testament, not New Testament. And yet churches will, will say, let's give Him a praise offering, uh, either praising, uh, clapping hands or raising uh, your hand or some kind of a thing. And yet He calls us that we're the sacrifices of praise, which is an entirely different thing than praise offering. Well, it's, in other words, you must learn to distinguish between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You must learn, therefore, to distinguish between Israel and the church. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. The third distinction that must be made, therefore, is the division into pieces or epochs of history. Now, I'm not going to take time to go into all of them, and different people have... Uh, number James, for the letter of Moody Bible, eight. Arm had four. Uh, I'll go. The I go. The bridge. I went through nine. Read the current and change the name. Most of them. I still hold seven. And uh, uh, here's uh, which one reason on the dispensationalism because we carry we uh, we the, is uh, teach what we teach and not what else is. All right. Uh, first of all is the period of human freedom. Spoiled conscious. Or Genesis. The next is Genesis chapter one verse eight. Chapter three verse six. This would have any in there. The first descent. He just mentions to that test and failed test. There is a judgment that comes because of the fear to that test. The test was not eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. The seventh day was eight, and the judgment was expulsion from earth. Therefore, God instituted the dispensation, and that was dispensation, which is known by Schofield as the dispensation of conscience, and that is from Genesis 4 1 through Genesis 18. There was required to operate. To self is to determine from the self to the soul, the earth and earth being right to the earth. And man became worse and worse and worse. There were only eight feet based there. Therefore, the majority of humans failed the test, and the demon was another slut. Take out a misery who failed to the earth and held us in cube. And then God put the race zero on eight per face, uh, or what became time of the human race. In just 18 through 9, uh, we find the family of Noah becomes the object of now his uh, revelation, uh, the test. And again, they were to practice righteousness. And what happened was that for the majority of the human race, they got worse and worse. Baal after Nimrod built the uh, which said we would be flawed. And the uh, the tower was the the worship of uh, Baal, the gods, and the, the, just the confusion of God confused the languages there, and again dispersed them over the face of the earth. So that in introduced the patriarchal rule, in which from the family of Noah, uh, God selected one family, the family of Abram and determined that he would deal with the, the earth through that. This is called the, the dispensation of promise by Schofield, but it begins in Genesis chapter 1140, and it goes through Genesis chapter 18, verse 27, and deals with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the, the, the strict family of Abram, uh, and this family is going to eventually become, uh, again, something else. But... Uh, the test there was to remain faithful to the teaching of Abram. They failed, and therefore they ended up in judgment and slavery in Egypt. Every dispensation ends with a judgment upon those who fail to live up to the test that God gives them. But salvation is the same by grace through faith in every dispensation. This introduces us to the Jewish dispensation, which is called the dispensation of law by Schofield, and this begins in... Uh, um, uh, Exodus 11, uh, 10, uh, and uh, or, or actually uh, runs all the way through Acts chapter 1, verse 26, and is continued in Revelation chapter 4, uh, 1 through 19, 21. Here, the, the family becomes a nation, and the nation's responsibility is to... Uh, uh, spread the gospel, to be, and to be faithful to do all the things that God has told them to do. And they failed, and the judgment was the, the judgment of the fifth cycle of discipline several times, and eventually the fifth cycle of discipline, which was administered in 70 A.D., in which there was not one stone left upon another. There was a brief overlap. The sixth dispensation, then, was instituted 
at Pentecost, and it's called the dispensation of the church. Uh, Schofield calls it the dispensation of grace, but uh, and uh, that's that is what he, it's called in Ephesians 3. But to distinguish it from the fact that grace is the method of salvation at all times, I use the word church to describe it, and it begins in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and it goes to Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. It is the dispensation of the church age, and the judgment that takes place is the constant judgment of divine discipline upon all believers during this period of time. Once the church is raptured, and the last part of the church, uh, the, the Jewish age takes place, we have then the millennial kingdom, which, uh, which is, uh, kicks in, and that runs, if described in Revelation 20, verse 1, to Revelation 22, 21, with selected Old Testament passages to describe it, because the millennial kingdom is basically a king which is related to Israel being the center of the earth. And uh, uh, as people relate to, to Israel, those things will be true. So those are periods. And the point of this is that if you, you must interpret the Bible literally. If you interpret the Bible literally, then certain things belong in a certain place, and you can take them out of one and put them in another. You have to leave them in the dispensation in which they belong. And so to consistently uh, do they have to have visions in which God to heals in different ways at different times. Just as during the early dispensation of uh, the, uh, the end of the Shadows in the book of Acts, the Gentiles go to Osh of Israel, specifically for that period of time. And uh, there are many other places. You must observe very clearly the periods or the epochs or dispensations. Uh, again, uh, Hodge and Burkhoff both are covered in but they, are, they both have four dispensations that they find, but they do not make the, the, the distinctions between Israel. Now, to give the, the final characteristics, there are five characteristics uh, that are related to the, uh, the church age, the distinction of the church age, and that uh, has to do with God's um, underlying uh, purpose uh, in the world, uh, under purpose in the world. Well, God says they is for they have two basic dispensations. Uh, they have two covenants, they call them. See, the covenant of was put in the garden, and the second covenant is a covenant of great. Look out, does the, the theologian. Come right after them, come all through, for cessation of God's try help. And so he's waiting only way. The God's saving plan is not his only program. God has many programs operating, all of which will glorify himself. He goes to blessing of uh, people, so the, uh, the spirit of growth, so they can advance by him. So these are the four characteristics. And I uh, but I do think that evil, I do something, so that when you see uh, a church, uh, it puts up a sign that says, we are a church. Uh, we were driving, I saw several churches, uh, uh, they're coming to a big sign. Faith Church. Nothing else said about it. Faith Church. Well, I wouldn't go near that with a 10-foot pole unless they told me more information. Just because they say Faith Church, it could mean anything. It could mean anything. Faith Church. That's the reason that we put our doctrinal statement in all of our books. We put a sign outside the door that tells them uh, we are uh, what we are so that they understand what they're getting into. We, are, we don't want to hide anything. We want everything to be open and above board so that people understand where we come from. And we teach the Word of God word by word, verse by verse, uh, from the particularly relating to the mystery doctrines of the New Testament of the Church Age, so that we can cause believers to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, think of our study, may God the Holy Spirit use these things as a source of challenge to each one. In Jesus' name, amen.